afternoon, and once again, I am grateful for the opportunity to be here, to meet you, to be with you for the occasion that brings us together, make me a servant workshop, as well as this Lord's Day, and uh, I am um, humbled by the opportunity, and certainly glad, thankful, I'll try to stay back here, is that about right, so y'all aren't looking down my ear, um, to be here and to speak with you. <clears throat> Now, I'm great with treating this like a Bible class, but generally that means you've got to speak up. And so if you want to interrupt me like you would normally interrupt the teacher, please, by all means, go right ahead and uh, um, treat me like family. I know my host did. They made, sh they made sure not even to serve me first this morning. Where's Annette? I was going to give her a hard time. <laughs> um, woke up, coffee pot didn't work, and so... Uh, Y'all, we'll give her a hard time for that, but wonderful uh, host congregation for this event, a great lunch, and a great time with uh, those who opened up their home for me. So sorry that my family could not be here to enjoy uh, this great weekend in hospitality, and, and Lord willing, in the future, we'll be able to do that. Turn with me to the book of Nehemiah. Our topic is just simply this, step up. And so we enter our, end our workshop this year with a call to action. In your Old Testament, there is at the end of what we might call the books of history, the book of Nehemiah. If you were to read your Old Testament beginning in Genesis and going all the way through the end of the book of, of Nehemiah, you would more or less read in chronological order the things that are happening with God and His covenant people. As we glare into these uh, events which happened uh, 500 years before Christ, we're going to see God's people working to, to accomplish a task at hand in, in God's city. And I think as we study this text, some of the present-day applications will become apparent. And then, as, as time allows, we'll want to make them very directly to our lives. And so let's set the, set the stage just a moment. There is nothing like getting back from lunch and having a history lesson. with no song before to get us all singing and the blood flowing. And so, here we go, right? In, oh, lands. We'd all get laughing after that. In Deuteronomy chapter 28, uh, in verse 15, God had said, if you follow me, I will bless you, but if you don't, I will curse you. That's, that's always been the way God has operated, right? There are two roads. You can follow the, the wide path to destruction. You can follow the, the narrow path to eternal life. Choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods that your father served beyond the river, the gods of Egypt, or choose Jehovah. Joshua said, Joshua 24, 15, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord our God. So there's always two. Well, that's what we find there. If you bless me, I will bless you. If you curse me, if you don't follow me, I will curse you. One of those cursings in Deuteronomy 28, beginning in verse 49 and going through verse 52, was the destruction of the city of Jerusalem by a foreign power. And those things came to pass in 586 B.C. Whenever God sent, providentially working, the armies of a man named Nebuchadnezzar from Babylon to besiege and destroy the city of Jerusalem. We are almost a hundred years, or over a hundred years after that fact when we open the book of Nehemiah. So the children of Israel have been carried into foreign captivity. They're no longer dwelling in the land of Israel, at least not all of them. Some have returned. The city that was once this precious jewel of God, where, where the, the psalmist would say in Psalm 137, verse 5, If I forget thee, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget her skill. If you forget what to, how to use your right hand, that's how close and the, the close association and dear um, position that Jerusalem held in the place for the Jews. And it was that way because God had placed his name there since the days of David. David had taken that city from the Jebusites. And there he had called it Jehovah is or Jehovah brings peace. Jehovah Shalom, Jerusalem. God is peace. So much so that he brought the Ark of the Covenant, not in the best way. Had the tabernacle there. Solomon built the temple there. And the Jews worshiped there. It had been laid in waste by that Babylonian army, not because of their superiority, but because of the Israelites' sin. However, 
during the days of Ezra, which you read about in the book of Ezra, um, <laughs> you see the rebuilding of the temple and the rebuilding of the, the law. But in Nehemiah, we open that book to find a great problem. So join me in Nehemiah chapter 1 and verse number 3. Nehemiah is not in Jerusalem. If you've ever watched a good movie, the book of Nehemiah would make a good movie, but you notice how there are things taking place in multiple areas. And so there's kind of like this, if you can imagine the camera showing us what's happening in Jerusalem, and it's showing us what's happening in a foreign capital called Susha or Sushan. That's the Persian capital. And so Nehemiah is under a Persian king whose name will be given to us in Nehemiah 2 and verse 1, Artaxerxes. You may have heard that name before. If not, it's on Wikipedia, right? You, you can look. Please don't do it now. Um, <laughs> but you can look it up, right? And so Nehemiah is serving, Nehemiah 121, as the cupbearer of the king. It would more or less be like the old English butler, the one who ruled the house and the household servants, not like the king's waiter, but the one who cared for and took care of his house as a servant underneath him. So that's Nehemiah's role. Nehemiah is in Susha, or Sushan, the Persian capital, and word comes back from Jerusalem and presents for us point number one. I've got like 40 points. I mean, so if you're trying to number these, good luck. But it presents for us the problem. Nehemiah 1 verse 3. They said unto me, the remnant that are left of the captivity. They returned there during the, the book of Ezra, during the days of Zerubbabel and Jeshua. The remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. Why? Well, here's why. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. Exactly what God had said would happen way back in Deuteronomy 28.52 had come to pass. The Israelites, in their failure to obey God, had lost their protection and provision from him. Jerusalem as a city had been ransacked, and now the walls laid in waste. To us in the modern world, that does not seem like or sound like a problem. So what if the walls aren't in, intact? However, understanding cities of antiquity, we understand that those walls are protection and provision uh, against those who would do harm that might come in to, to steal, to plunder, or to overtake and so it's like a defenseless city. It's, it's like being naked in the cold. That's what the city's like. And so it becomes a shame because Jerusalem, remember, is a city to be remembered. It's a city where God's name dwelt. It's a city where the, the psalmist could not forget it just like he could not forget his right hand. He'll go on to say in Psalm 137 and verse 6, let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth if I do not remember you. In other words, if I fail to, to uh, remember Jerusalem, I will forget how to speak. That's how important the city was to the faithful Jew. The Lord had blessed and would continue to bless, but the problem for God's people was that in a law laid waste. Now, Nehemiah is going to set forward a goal. And so if you're in Nehemiah 1.3, Go over and read Nehemiah 2.18. And since nobody's speaking up, somebody can read that for us out loud. The rest of y'all can read it quietly, but somebody, if you would, read it out loud. And I told them of the hand of my God, which had been good upon me, and also of the king's words that he had spoken to me. All right. Excellent. So we have then the blessing of God that's going to be. Now, what is that blessing of God going to accomplish? Go back, if you would, one verse and read Nehemiah 2, 17 for us as well. We've already read verse 18. Let's consider 17. Then I said to them, you see the distress that we are in, how Jerusalem lies waste and its gates are burned with fire. Come and let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer be a reproach. Now, for God's people, as you read verse 18, thank you for reading. As For God's people, as you read verse 18, this is not something they expected to do on their own, but rather the hand of God would guide them. But God wasn't putting those bricks back up, y'all. He wasn't going to do it. Only God's faithful people would go about accomplishing this task. So what was the goal? It was simple, it was clear, it was straight. Let's build the wall. That's it. That's the goal. What you'll notice as you read this is that Nehemiah is a good and great leader. 
He sets forward very clear problems to accomplish the um, very clear goals to, to accomplish in order that the problem might be dealt with effectively and simply. You know there are people in leadership roles who tend to make things more complicated than they ought to be. And then there are those that are able, through seeing the big picture, to simplify it so that we can all understand what the problem is and how we are looking to achieve this or to overcome this problem. In Nehemiah 2, 17 and 18, Jerusalem lies in waste, the walls are torn down, and because of that, we're ashamed. So, what are we going to do? Let us build the wall. Verse 18, let us rise up and build. The solution to the problem was simple. Now, let's keep this in the book of Nehemiah. Let's not think about us today, but are there any problems that we can think of that exist in our world where the church has the answer? Are there any problems in the congregation where there is a simple or clear solution? Okay. Then we can begin to see how this applies. Absolutely. And so you're going to notice there that um, even whenever God blesses, God also expects. And so uh, it, it's very clear. It's an excellent, excellent point. Uh, as we think about that present day application, those should still be coming up. And so uh, feel free to raise your hand if you can't get your attention. Throw something at me, right? That's what we're doing in Bible <laughs> class this morning if you weren't here uh, throwing stuff at me. Um, now, I know that we skipped a whole lot of things between 1 verse 3 and 2, 17 and 18. And, you know, we could, I would love for you to read through that and consider it. But what I want you to see is that between this time of uh, Nehemiah being in, in Susha and whenever he makes his way to Jerusalem, there are at least two things that happen in, in a uh, very clear way that, that apply to what we're talking about today. And we're going to spend time very briefly on them, although they might be the most important. Number one is prayer. Nehemiah is going to start in Nehemiah 1.4 and he's going to pray the rest of the chapter. When he faces the king, he's going to pray, 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 pray. When there's a problem, there needs to be prayer. Now, prayer didn't do it, right? Prayer didn't build the walls either. But prayer needed to be there. And so prayer, that's, that's a key point. And so allow that for someone else a different day to stress the importance of prayer. But as you read this, do not neglect. The second one is planning. Nehemiah goes to Jerusalem and he doesn't tell anyone he's there, doesn't tell anyone why he's there. And he walks around, rides around, that he might survey and understand the problem fully. Man, that's a pretty good uh, wisdom in that. Any of you ever work for somebody? Maybe you're, you're in like a, a role below middle management. And they bring in a middle manager that's never seen or done anything. And they change everything. And they've never, they, don't, they don't have a clue what's going on. Nehemiah's not like that. Nehemiah's exactly what we'd expect from a good leader. Whether that was in a, a civic role, like a, like a city manager, whether that was in a military role, like, a, like an officer that would come in, and, and maybe if you've served in the military, you've seen some, some lieutenants, first lieutenants that come in. I'm not familiar with the Navy, whatever that is in the Navy. But first lieutenants who come in, they change everything. Never even been there, right? And the NCO starts telling them what they should do, and then, psh, I'm an officer, listen to me. <laughs> Nehemiah's not like that. You see it in business. You see it in, in um, schools. Nehemiah's not like that. He's a good, he's a good um, leader in that way. So you're going to see the prayer. You're going to see the planning. And that's going to take us then as we get to chapter 3 where we want to focus a little bit more of our time. And in chapter 3, it's just a long list of names. And man, that's boring. <laughs> but it's not. In Nehemiah chapter 3, it's the people. You see, the work can't get done without the people. Nehemiah chapter 3 is probably, if you're reading through the book, the least exciting the most boring of all of the chapters there. In other chapters, there is drama, there is intrigue, there is, uh, there is conflict. In Nehemiah, it's just a list of people. But do you know who's going to do the great work of rebuilding the city of Jerusalem? People. It's like reading a church directory. <laughs> there ain't nothing exciting about that, is there? Until you read about it and you remember who those folks are. And if it's a church directory that you've been a part of, and you know those people, then it is. It's not just pictures on a page or names on a page. 
It's, it's real folks doing real things. Now, as I survey chapter 3, I want to, to prime you. That's not fair, but I'm teaching, so I'm going to. I'm going to prime you for some things to look, at, look for and to look at. As I read this entire chapter, I'm going to notice that there are people from different nations coming together. That's crazy. Because primarily it's the Jews who are doing this, but also I see in Nehemiah 3 and verse 7, it's those of the Gibeonites. Who remembers the Gibeonites the first time they make their way on the pages of God's Word in the promised land? You remember what they did? Uh huh. Book of Joshua. They're liars. They're liars. But they, co they coexisted with them. And they're here. Different nations came together to build this. Now, of those of the Jews, they also came from different places, different geographies. For instance, in verse 2, you have the men of the city of Jericho. In verse 5, you have the Tekoites. In verse 7, you've got those from beyond the river. In verse 10, you have who? Uh, verse 9, sorry, the district of Jerusalem. If you look, you're going to see there are people from all over the areas of Judah and Benjamin. There are those from inside the city, like verses 9 and 10. There are those from outside the city, and people from all of these different areas, whether it be like an urban center like Jerusalem, or whether it be rural areas like Tekoa, they have come together for this. I also notice that they have different jobs. In verse 1, there are those of the priests. That's their job. But it's not just the priests who are doing this. In fact, if I were to read and, and see in verse 8... Notice there, next to him, repaired Uzael, the son of Hariah, goldsmiths. And next to them, Hananiah, one of the perfumers. As you continue reading in verse 9, you have a ruler of the half of the city. A ruler in verse 12. A ruler in verse 14. A ruler in verse 15. Priest in verse 22. Priest in verse 28. Merchants in verse 32. Goldsmiths. It didn't matter your job. Who what job keeps you from the work of the church, the work of rebuilding the wall? There's not one. Everyone, no matter where you were from, no matter what your ethnicity was, as long as you're you know, supposed to be in the land, was supposed to be a part of the work. It didn't matter if you were a ruler or you were a merchant. If you were a smith, if you worked with your hands, or, or someone who worked with money, it didn't matter. You were supposed to be involved in the work of the rebuilding the wall. Interesting. I also noticed something that we might not expect. Your gender did not matter. Now, we understand there are different roles as, as God designed. That's not the issue. But there was work to be done by men and women. Look at verse 12. Nehemiah chapter 3, this boring list of names. Notice here, I have next to him repaired Shalom, the son of Halohesh, the ruler of half the district of Jerusalem. He and his daughters. Isn't that interesting? Both men and women were involved in this great work. It needed to be done. It was a work that, that required the utmost urgency and importance. And so it was the proverbial all hands on deck. That's all I know about the Navy. <laughs> all hands on deck, right? That means everybody gets to work. And with the inclusion of the daughters, what else do you notice? Who was involved? Verse 12. The leaders as well, like the rulers, and so that's going to become a problem later. Good. That's not all, though. If a man and his daughters are both doing it, what do we call them? Families. Families. And I see that in verse 1 when he talks about uh, the priest and his brethren. I see that in verse 3 as well, whenever you get those who come together of different families. And I see that in verse 12. The work was to be done by families. I wonder... If there is any application of those coming together to accomplish the work of the church from various nations, from various areas, from various jobs, from various genders, various genders, there's only two. I'm from Austin, but still there's only two. Um, getting our families involved. I wonder if there's any application that could be made to the work of the church. Probably not. This is probably just a boring list of, of names in the Old Testament. What do you think? Of course there is, right? Of course there is. 
We see the same thing in regards to the work of the church, and we'll speak to that more as we get to the end of our class and make, uh, attempt to make some application. As you read those, through those names, it's not just a boring list. You're going to find people from all classes, people from all areas, but all of them are engaged in one purpose, to rebuild the wall, 217, to rise up and build, 218, knowing that God would bless them. Now, skip over to chapter 4. What was the attitude that prevailed in the rebuilding of the wall? You'll see this in verses 1 through 6, but for time's sake, we might draw our attention to verse 6 simply. Nehemiah says, so we built the wall. The wall was joined together up to half its height. And so the job's halfway done, a little over, but still. Why could you accomplish this, Nehemiah? Aaron said it. For the leaders were good leaders. Nope. That wasn't it. For the rulers were good examples. That wasn't it. For the people, that's all those folks that were listed back in verse 3. The church directory, I mean, that boring list of names that they were reading through. They had a mind to work. And what happened? Well, whenever you've got leaders doing what they should be doing, and you've got people with a, a mind to work, and you've got everyone coming together for this cause with the appropriate planning, and it is the case that it's saturated with prayer, there should be no expectation then that if God wants His work to be accomplished, His people can do it. So look at verse 20. It introduced, sorry, chapter 2, verse 20. It introduces this entire section. Someone, if you would, chapter 2 and verse 20 for us. There was provisions that were expected from God. God had provided, God's providence, for letters from the king, for materials from the forest. And it was the case that they could say, if this be God's work, and if God's people be engaged, saturated with prayer and the appropriate planning, that God will do it. He's not going to stack those stones. But if His people do His work, He will do it. The provision then is seen in chapter 2 and verse 20 by introduction into all of this section. As I continue reading in chapter 4, what I'm going to find is that problems arise. And if you've ever been engaged in the work of the church, you know that problems will arise. Sometimes big and sometimes small, but here's what I notice as I read chapters 4, 5, and 6, is they come from every direction. In chapter 4 and chapter 6, they come from those who are outside of the, the Jews, outside of the children of Israel, outside of those who have their hand to, to the plow, to the proverbial plow, doing the work. They are those famous people. And if you've read the book of, of Nehemiah, who are the great, um, you know, bad guys? Yeah, I mean, they're, they're the neighbors right there, probably precursors to the Samarit Samaritans, right? Um, so you've got Sanballat and his boys. All right, so <laughs> Sanballat, Jesse, you said uh, Tobiah, and then those are the two primary. And then who else are you going to get? Geshem. And so they're going to lead those of the nations around the, Arab the Arabians, the Ammonites, and the Ashdodites. And so what do they do? They want the work, the good work which is being done in Jerusalem to be stopped. And they appeal to the authorities to get it to stop. Okay? That they appeal to, in chapter 2, they appealed to emotion and reason. They said, y'all are a bunch of idiots. And Nehemiah said, we're God's people doing God's work. Uh, but, but they are going to, to continue to work against Nehemiah in this way. They want these things to end. As we skip to chapter 6, and we're just going to survey some things, Nehemiah, he faces them, he stands up to this opposition, and he says, you know what, I am doing a great work, Nehemiah 6 and verse 3. They wanted him to turn his back and run, and Nehemiah is a guy I can get behind, because he'll say in Nehemiah 6, 6 and verse 11, should such a man as I flee? It's one of the great lines of Scripture. We're God's people doing God's work. Do you think I'm going to run from God's enemies? 
The psalmist would say, and it doesn't matter if I'm set against ten thousands of people. If ten thousands of people have set themselves against me. Paul would say in Romans 8, that verse 31, if God be for us, who can be against us? That's not a question that has no answer. In fact, everyone can be against us. But who shall prevail against us? And the answer there is no one. That's the case with Nehemiah. He faced opposition to his works. There were distractions. There were obstacles. There were hurdles. And in the midst of that, Nehemiah 5 and verse 1, some of the saddest things you'll read during this time period that in the Bible we might call the restoration. It's when they come back to Jerusalem. It's called the restoration. He says, There arose a cry of the people and of their wives against their brethren, the Jews. Man. You expect pressure. You expect distraction. You expect opposition from the outside. But you don't expect it from the inside. The truth is it will come. And it doesn't matter how strong a congregation is. It doesn't matter how good the work is. There will be those who put obstacles and distractions in place from the midst of, of, a, of the people. We see that in the midst of this great work. And what they had done was they were, um, the, the folks were building the wall couldn't work. So the people who had deep pockets loaned and uh, charged them some interest. And so it's kind of financially robbing uh, the poor. And so Nehemiah is going to, as a great leader would, get both parties down and say, you know, you guys are being... Idiots. I counted the ten, but that's what they are. You guys are being foolish. This isn't godly. This isn't good. And they're going to repent. And good things will happen. And the work will press on. Because what you see in the midst of a people who have a mind to work and leaders who are good and godly leaders, as they are on the same page in the midst of these hurdles and these distractions, in the midst of these obstacles, they will go about the business of God. And while they may slow down the work, and they do in chapter 4, they do in chapter 5, and for a moment they do in chapter 6, nonetheless, God's work is done, chapter 6 and verse 15. So the wall was finished. Now, that solves the problem, but if you've read the rest of the book of Nehemiah, you know more problems are going to arise more things are going to come. Nehemiah is going to be the governor of the city of Jerusalem, Nehemiah 10 and verse 1. And so the rest of the book of Nehemiah will deal with some of those things that they overcome. But for us, as we think about this book, looking at Nehemiah 1 through Nehemiah 6, the problem that's given, the wall of Jerusalem is broken down, Nehemiah 1, 3. And we bookend that with Nehemiah 6, 15. The work on the wall was finished. It was built in 52 days. It had lied waste for years until you had a leader and people who were ready to get to work. So what was it, do you think, that caused this to be accomplished? Well, it seems to me, especially as I read there at the end of chapter 2, verses 17 through 20, and we've read parts of that, that whenever God's will was invoked, to read the, the, the rebuilding of the wall. When God's will was invoked, and whenever God's blessing was requested, and whenever you had people who were willing to see it through, there was nothing that could stop them from accomplishing that. You see, whenever God is... Whenever God is called to action, that's, that's, we do that for, through prayer. When God is called to action, and whenever His will is clearly seen, spiritual people will do everything in their power to accomplish spiritual things. Now, that's the book of Nehemiah. Question, thoughts, or comments on Nehemiah 1 through 6. Quick survey, because we're going to seek to make some application today on these points. Anything on those chapters? All right, so as we think about then the work of the church, let's start with this. What is the work of the church today? And we can talk about this in a number of different terms. To spread the gospel, okay? So the work of the church is to spread the gospel. What do we often call that? Evangelism, all right? Evangelism. 
All right, that is the, the great commission that's seen uh, as we read in Matthew 28, 18 through 20. So to um, make known the mystery of the manifold wisdom of God is the purpose of the church. All right, and so that's uh, Ephesians 3, 8 through 11. To edify one another. <laughs> All right, in all things glorify God. Let's come back to that one. Oh, to edify one another. To edify one another. And so we talk about evangelism, preaching the good news. Usually we mean to the lost. But we also evangelize the saved. Well, what does that mean? Well, that's not the term we use. But it's building up. Okay. That's why Paul could say to the Christians in Romans 1.15, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. They're already saved. They don't need to be saved, but they still need the gospel. That's growth that's going to happen, right? Paul would tell the Ephesian elders when we met with them in Miletus in Acts chapter 20, he would say, Now I commend you to God and the word of His grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them that are sanctified. The teaching there of edification, building up the saved. Absolutely. Evangelism, yes. Edification, what else does a, does a church serve to do? Political change. That's not the purpose of the church. It might happen, but that's not the purpose, right? Okay. Road construction. Nope, that's not it. We exist to conform our wheels to the Word of God or, or to the, the person of God through His Word, okay? What else? Work in the church. Helping those in need, right? And so we talked about people in spiritual need, right? You've got evangelism and edification to build up spiritual need. But the church also has the authority and is expected to do good to all men, especially those in the household of faith, right? We see that in Galatians chapter 6. And so sometimes when we talk about the work of the church, we'll say benevolence, edification, and evangelism. That's a pretty good summary as you read the New Testament. You're not going to find a passage that says this is what you, you know, this is the work of the church. But when you begin to, to uh, summarize and put together, yeah. For what purpose? Well, Ephesians 3, 20 and 21 would probably speak to that pretty well. Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that you ask or think, to him be glory in the church forever and ever. Amen. It's to bring God glory. And we do that through his way. We, we don't do that through our way. So we're going to bring God glory through good works. Works of benevolence where we help those in need. Thinking especially there about physical need. We help those who are... In, in, uh, in physical need, in spiritual need, those who are lost without the gospel. And then we build up the saved through edification. And so, here's the question. Considering the works of the church, is there any application from the book of Nehemiah, especially verses 1 through 6? You and I are building walls. We're not. That's generally a bad thing in the New Testament, right? Jesus is tearing down walls. But we're not building walls to, to keep people out or, or to keep people in or to keep gates closed on the Sabbath. We're not doing that. We have a different work and task, but are there applications that can be made? Man, we skip through so much of Nehemiah. But they are, you know, and you see this also in the rebuilding of the temple. But there are constant threats. You know how they have to build? They have their sword on their side, right? There's, there's someone on lookout making sure that no one's coming to attack. That's determination. That's dedication. Can we bring those same kind of things into the work of the church? I hope so. Yes, sir. I have brought a lot of people together. People coming together from all different walks, from all different paths, from all different backgrounds. That's what the church is supposed to do. That's exactly right. You have your hand up, you just wave it. There was work for everyone. We live in a world where the idea of every member working has been rejected for about 1,500 years. There is a clergy laity system where there are those who are the religious workers and then those who are just the everyone else. And Christianity, and I use that in the broadest terms like the world does, is where you come into a building and you open your mouth and someone else pours it in. That's not, that's not what I read about in the Bible. I read everyone, not just coming together, but now having a job. In fact, in some religions, they actually will drink the communion for you. Um, and so that's, that's, not, that's not the scriptures, though. Yes, sir? Uh, like in the church today, we're, it would help for us to you know, realize that our elders are God-appointed men. And they pray 
worry about the work and when they decide to do something, it is our job to support them 100% of the three of you can to help the board So if a congregation is blessed to have elders, like this one, this one is, then that, that, those elders are not appointed by the congregation. They are appointed by the Holy Spirit. And now that's not some mystical, magical way where smoke comes out of a building. That's because the Spirit gave qualifications whereby those men might be selected, chosen, recognized as elders. And if they invoke God, and they have a plan that is according to His will, now if not, don't follow them. But if they do, if they've invoked God, and they have a plan according to His will, then it's our, our responsibility as members to, to work. It's their responsibility as elders to work with us. They're not overlords, right? First Peter chapter 5, 1 through 4. They're not overlords. They're working with us. But as members, we're working. We're working with them. Absolutely. What, a, what an excellent point. That I think ties in ever so well with the book of Nehemiah and leadership. What else? I've got a list, but y'all's is better. <laughs> Nehemiah, they were defending with the sword. We defend with our sword. Sure. We defend the truth with our sword, which is the word of God. And we need to make sure that we have our sword ready to defend. And that means through study and, uh, yep. and understanding that we, we too are on the attack from the outside. And that is truly, if we use our opinions, that's, that's no true defense. The Absolutely. The only defense is with the word of God. So. The, uh, the military imagery is, is throughout the New Testament. He would say, Wherefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand in the evil day, having done all. Therefore, stand. Stand, therefore, having girded your loins with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, with all taking up the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench the fiery darts of the evil one. And then, as Aaron was saying, and take up the sword of the Spirit, helm of salvation. That sword of the Spirit, of course, is the Word of God. Absolutely. Ephesians chapter 6, verses uh, 11 through 17. And so, absolutely. Let's ask this question. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> okay. There, there has to be cooperation, right? Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. So the, conf the confrontations could have taken the attention off of the, the priority at hand, the goal, the mission. But there you see working through it so that it doesn't. Now, those problems have to be dealt with. Some of them, I mean, these problems have to be dealt with. But they did not have to take away the primary purpose or goal. Excellent point. All right. Great minds think alike. Okay? So did not great minds, but that was great. That was a great thought. Um... <laughs> Let's ask this question then. Is there any need that this congregation has in your opinion? That's dangerous, but y'all might be on the road and go home. <laughs> you hear the bell ring. <laughs> they ringing a bell? <laughs> Is there any need that this congregation has? There's much to do. There's work on their brain. Okay. Mark the cry for help goes ringing to the land. I've noticed that the congregation here is involved in a lot of works, okay? Maybe more than you might expect from a congregation of this size, the size of community. I promise there is. If you don't know where the, where the work is, there are some folks that will point you in the right direction. They, they will let you know what needs to be done. But if you're like other congregations, I might expect that you need some Bible class teachers. That's probably something we need. Maybe, maybe you're blessed beyond measure. Maybe you're not. Maybe you need not Bible class teachers, but a new generation of Bible class teachers. Maybe you need that. Maybe there's a need. Maybe it is the case that we need some men who need to step up into the role of deacons. Maybe not. Maybe everyone here that's, that's qualified is, is in that role already. But maybe it's the case that you don't see any need to qualify yourself as a man or as a family. Maybe it's the case that we need elders, more elders. Maybe it's not a man that's qualified right now. Maybe it's a man that's not doing anything to qualify himself in two, three, four, ten years. It's time to step up. It's time to step up in those roles. To look into those things that we see. What about evangelists? Now, I don't know how many baptisms we had in the past 
year, two years, ten years. I know that there's, a, because Aaron reports and, and lets us know good work that happens at the home. I, I know there are others close to Jesse. But if you're like every other uh, congregation that I know, there's a whole lot of folks in this community that aren't saved. So there's something we can do right there. There are people that need to hear the gospel. There is something to do. There is work on every hand. There is what we might consider mundane stuff. Just dealing with the physical grounds, the building. Ronnie talked yesterday about the preparation of the Lord's Supper. And how important those things are. We have, I know that you have a number of good and godly folks serving in various roles. But there is always more work that can be done. I've never yet met a congregation who had too many workers and not enough work. Instead, what I find is congregation has too much work and not enough workers. And they end up having to cut things out. Because there are people who are unwilling to step up into the role. It is the case that if you see a need in the congregation, you then have, if you have the ability, you have the responsibility to meet that need. And that's the case for every member here. I'm not encouraging you to usurp any authority in any way, but if there is a need that, that has to be fulfilled, then you fulfill that in one of two ways. Either stepping into that role or preparing yourself to step into that role. We talked a lot this morning about uh, evangelism in our, in our first class. And so as I think about where I'm at in evangelism, maybe where I want to be, I say one day I want to be someone who can sit down and teach another person the gospel. Right now I don't feel comfortable with that, but I want to be that. I want to be able to fulfill that role when called upon. And so I hope that someday God blesses me with that. That's like saying I hope someday God puts them stones on the wall. What are you going to do? Are you going to study, shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace? Are you going to observe someone giving a Bible study? Are you going to set in as a silent partner and help? Or are you just play, waiting for God to, to bestow some fairy dust on you? God doesn't work that way. never has, never will. God did not put those bricks together. What are you doing to work to fulfill the need? Is that need immediate and something that you can accomplish, that you can step into? Let's do it. Let's get to work. But is that need something that you see that is a, is a need and a role, but you're not quite ready? Well, what are we going to do to work to fill that need? The idea that says that's someone else's job. I don't know that that's a principle found in Scripture. The idea that there are people more qualified or better than me. Now, if you're a woman and the job is elder, yeah, you're right. You got me. <laughs> but to say that idea of that's someone else's job is one of no responsibility and no ownership. And what I see in regards to the Israelites in Nehemiah chapter 3 is that everyone under the leadership of godly men stood in to work. They fulfilled, and as you notice, as you read through there, they fulfilled their role and worked in their place. We don't know anything of those who were working at the old gate and desired to be at the fish gate. What we noticed were those who were busy about the work assigned to them, and they were ready to fill whatever role that they were called upon to fill. The congregation here, I know, and you know, probably better than me, has holes which can be filled, has work which can be done, and y'all have workers who are capable and able. As we close out this Make Me a Servant workshop, I ask you not to wait and pray for just God's blessings on you as a servant, but instead look for places where you can serve. And if there are places where you want to serve but you don't feel qualified or capable, Let's work to get there so that together, hand in hand, we can accomplish the work of the church just like they did in the great task that was set before them in Nehemiah chapter 1, the problem that was solved in Nehemiah chapter 6. We're going to offer the Lord's invitation tonight. We'll have an invitation song. I believe it will be displayed behind me. We've had a great morning this morning already with one being uh, restored and coming home. If you have any need, if we need to study the scriptures with you that you might see with clarity. How Jesus can become Lord of your life because He is Lord of all. We would love to do that. If there's maybe something that's amiss in your life and you need the, the congregation here to pray for you, to help you, maybe even forgive you. If you have any need, we encourage you to make it known as together we stand and as we sing.